Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Car Luke at Home and Binbrook at Home. This is our worship service for this March, and I ask you to just look at your email and follow a bit of a rough order, which is very simple. And um, yeah, we just hope that we can have a good time together. So if you want to begin, we'll start with our call to worship from our PWSND reading. Um, you may join me out loud uh, as the many. God set the prophet down in a valley of dry bones. And together we say, asking, can these bones live? Commanding, hear the word of the Lord, promising, I will put my spirit in you and you will live. Jesus wept at the tomb of his friend. Together, hearing the grief, Lord, if you had been there, knowing the doubt, could not he, commanding life out of death, Lazarus come out? We are tempted by hopelessness and despair. Together, in our own pain at the world's brokenness, saying our bones are dried up, our hope is lost. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Together, let us pray, Creator God, we wait for you, and in your word we hope. For with you is steadfast love and great power to redeem. Help us to trust you and to share your resurrection life with all people and the whole creation. So may all be raised from despair to hope, from darkness to light, from death to life, through Jesus Christ, who is the resurrection and the life. Amen. These words are incredibly fitting for today as we seek God to lead us not into a temptation of fear and anxiety or hoarding or whatever other things might be distracting us from following him, but to um, just put our eyes on him. Our scripture reading for this morning, it starts with Matthew 6, verse 13. You may recall that we've been going through the Lord's Prayer during Lent. Matthew 6, verse 13 says, lead us not into temptation. I'd also like to read from Psalm 32, and I encourage you to keep this scripture in front of you as I'll be referring to it without a lot of comment later on in, this, in the service. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you while you may be found. Surely when the mighty waters rise, they will not reach us. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you and watch over you. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they would not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds those who trust in him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous, Sing all you who are upright in heart. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our sermon this morning is titled Firm Feet. You know, there used to be an annual fundraiser uh, in a little town in Belmont, Ontario. It was called Donkey Baseball. My family used to go there every year. It was such a blast. What would happen is you would have a pitch hitter, but but the, the runner would um, have to go on a donkey to ride around the bases. And the outfielders would have to ride the donkey uh, in order to catch the ball. And no play could be made unless the donkey was with you. It was hilarious. 
hilarious because as we all know donkeys just have a mind of their own they would buck and kick off their players they would run off on their own and nothing quite epitomizes the saying as stubborn as a donkey as watching donkey baseball now stubbornness is a natural trait of donkeys as unfortunately it is for most of us especially when it comes to waiting I am not a fan of waiting. I hate waiting in lines. I hate waiting for my Amazon packages to come in. I hate being on hold waiting to elevator music. I'm waiting to play with my iPad again, which if you recall, I gave up for Lent and it's been pretty hard. I'm waiting for my quarantine to end, which has also been really frustrating. For an introvert who's usually in her head the other day, I heard someone talking and I looked around the room and there was no one. As a matter of fact, I was talking to myself. I'm losing it. I'm waiting and waiting and waiting. It's hard, especially during these 40 days of Lent. But waiting is not new for God's people and neither is the number 40. Recall how the Israelites waited 40 years in the desert to get to the promised land, or how Moses for 40 days and nights received from God the Ten Commandments, how Jesus, after he resurrected, spent 40 days revealing himself until he ascended, or how the disciples prayed 40 days earnestly for Pentecost to come. And of course, in relation to our scripture today are the 40 days and nights that Jesus spent in the desert without food, without water, and having been tempted by the evil one. Lead us not into temptation. You see, there's something about waiting that often brings about temptations. The Spectator this past week noted that 20% of Canadians believe that COVID-19 is exaggerated. They also noted that many young adults call the issue NBD, no big deal. Some are tempted to hoard money, to hoard food, toilet paper. Amazon sales have grown exponentially as people find themselves um, or are entertaining themselves with purchasing power. Temptation, says the dictionary, is the desire to do something wrong or particularly unwise. For the Christian, temptation means doing something that draws our hearts and our desire and our focus and our trust away from God and his purposes. Oddly enough, when I was quite a bit younger, I actually never repeated this part of the Lord's Prayer out loud. Now that may seem strange to you, and as I think about it now, I don't even know why the idea popped in my head, but I had this idea that if I prayed, don't lead me into temptation, if God didn't hear my prayer, he would actually cause so much temptation in my life that I would fail, and so I was scared to do it, so I never prayed it out loud. I know that sounds crazy, but it shows that there's a confusion. Why do we pray, Lord, don't lead me into temptation? Well, it's not a prayer where we're asking God to miraculously uh, make our feet go in a different direction so that we don't head to the snack cupboard or that we don't get tempted to do something. Much of that has to do with our own free will and taking control over our own behavior. We might rather ask the question, if God doesn't lead us into temptation, where is he leading us? Firstly, maybe we have to break down root words from Greek and Aramaic, and basically they boil down to the word testing. You know, the way in which kids take exams to discover their aptitude or skill set or their knowledge. The Hebrew word is masa, which means a place of testing. It's a physical place where the Israelites tested God's faithfulness by complaining all the time. Do not lead us into testing. Testing whom? Well, God. Take a moment and reflect what we've learned about the Lord's Prayer, at least for those of you who have been journeying with us this Lent. We've learned that God is our Father, the one in charge of the whole kingdom, the kingdom of peace, 
the one whose will is to deliver and to redeem, who provides our daily bread and forgives us. If we not only recall these things, but live by them, we will not be led to test God to mistrust him or complain or be filled with suspicion or even to try and find the answers of why is God letting this virus take over the world? It's to, to not be led to give in to anxiety and fear and hoarding and sinful behaviors that say we reject God and we reject his good intentions toward us. So you may wonder, why did I begin this passage talking about stubborn donkeys playing baseball. Well, if you'll recall in Psalm 32, God says, don't be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but have to be dragged or controlled by a bit and bridle. God, I'm sure would really enjoy watching donkey baseball, delighting as we do in the humor of donkeys bucking off riders and the laughter that comes when the donkey stubbornly stops and puts their anchors down. But our Father in heaven, like any father, has no desire to put a bit and bridle in our mouths and drag us to where he wants us to go. He desires that we come willingly, following his lead. So look again at Psalm 32. Where does God lead us? Verse 1 says, He leads us to the blessedness of receiving forgiveness. Verses 6 and 7, He leads us to safety from rising waters that seek to overwhelm us or sever our relationship with God. He leads us to safe hiding places and surround us with the knowledge that God will deliver us. And verse 8, how does God lead us? He instructs us. He teaches us the way we should go. He counsels us. And he always, always, always keeps on loving and a protective watch over us. If we pray, Lord, lead us to a place where we will not test your love and faithfulness, that we would trust you and that our feet would follow your lead, then we are truly praying, lead us not into testing. Scripture has already has uh, over 20 verses that call us to keep our eyes on God and to let him lead and call us to not turn to the left or to the right. For example, Psalm 18 verse 36 prays, you have brought in the path beneath my feet so that my ankles do not turn. You see, following God, taking his lead is to follow his path. And rather than being a stubborn donkey, perhaps we might think of ourselves more as mules. Now, work with me on this. I'm not really calling you a mule, but we're going with an allegory here. You see, mules are more patient and live longer than horses and are less um, obstinate than the donkey. And so that's why... They've made this cross between the donkey and a horse to create a mule. Mules have the agility to walk on narrow, treacherous trails, particularly in the mountains or on the Grand Canyon, which Henry and I visited last year. They are sure-footed on these trails. And the one thing donkeys will not, absolutely not do, is proceed on a path that is unsafe for them. Their donkey's stubbornness is actually a life preserver for them. Well, if we were mules, we would follow God. We would not go where his trust and love for him would be lost to us. So maybe it's not so bad if we get a little stubborn about not walking where we should not go, whether that be in thought or word or in deed and especially during these times of Lent and isolation, that we would not be tempted to turn our feet to the left or to the right because it preserves our life and keeps us on the right path. We pray, Lord, lead us not into testing, but help us to deepen our trust in you. Jesus, when he was tested in the desert, depended on the words from Scripture and their promises as his protection. He did not succumb to desiring bread more than God or knowing 
with great assurance that God would provide for him. He did not test God by asking for some outrageous miracle to protect him from throwing himself down, expecting angels to save him, but used his good sense. And he never honored his own desire, wants, or wishes. He chose to worship the Lord his God and only him. These are the words that we have today to strengthen us, to be a little bit mulish, to be stubborn enough to not walk on paths that take us the wrong way, paths that question whether or not God is with us during these times, questions that try to answer what God is doing, perhaps even to evil people or people who just don't seem to care or call it a no big deal. Whatever judgments we may make, they take our eyes off of Jesus. And so we pray for this world and we pray for one another. And we pray for God's guidance and his grace. We pray, lead us not into temptation so that we may follow the right path toward God. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Together we give thanks with God that he is near us and that he is with us. Today we want to pray for... Um, Continued health for Grace Butter. We want to remember Pat Powell and the loss of his brother, Larry. We also, Henry and I, continue to pray for Dad, who is um, in his last days. There are many others of us for whom we pray who are all feeling the loneliness and the extent of isolation and the difficulty with getting the things that we need. And we just pray for one another to be strengthened. We pray for our young people who are having to do schoolwork online, which is also a, a great challenge, and it's not for everyone. We pray for any stresses and anxieties that we may feel. As we finish this time of worship, it is my hope and my prayer, as is on my wall, that together with all of God's saints, we might know just how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ for each one of us. Go in peace.